Welcome to the God Only Encouraging Message and Prayer Series. Messages from the Heart of God. To let you know that He gives you mercy for your failures and you find grace to help in good time for every need. Today we're talking about how God answers your prayer. God wants you to come to Him. He wants you to ask Him those things that you have need of. And He wants you to see those answers all around you. But many times, we don't know how to pray to God. We don't know what to ask Him. We don't know if our prayers are even going beyond the 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 ceiling which we're living at. And so, I want to remind you of what God tells you. In 1 John five fourteen through 15, He says, This is the confidence that you have in me. That if you ask anything according to my will, I hear you. And you can know that if I hear you, that whatever you ask, you know that you have those things that you have asked of me. So you have to first know that God is hearing. And secondly, that God is answering. But how do you know? If God will answer your prayer, how do you know that God is trying to get your attention and getting you to pray certain things or you're praying certain things and you don't know if it's what God's wanting you to pray or you just don't have confidence that you're praying the right way? Well, I'm here to tell you, he knew that you needed a helper and he gives you a helper. It's called his Holy Spirit and he gives you another helper. It's called his son, Jesus Christ. And they both are interceding on your behalf all the time. You don't know necessarily how you ought to ask God to do certain things as you ought to do. But they do. They know what your heart is. They know what God's will is. And they know how to ask God on your behalf because they're your intercessors. And then the Holy Spirit himself also will stir your heart and mind. And that's what we want to talk about in today's message on how to reveal what's really going on behind the scenes and let you know that God's really listening to you because he's your father and let you know that you can see on this side of heaven the truth that God does answer. You may not know how he's going to answer or what direction he's going to go or how he's going to get the answers to you. You don't have to know that. What you have to know is God's a faithful God and he will do all those things that he says he will do. He even says to you, if your father who is in heaven, he gives you good and advantageous things to those who keep asking him. There's one of the principles. You have to ask God and you have to keep on asking him. The asking isn't to remind God because God didn't forget and he knew what you needed before you asked him. The continued asking is to make sure that you know it's God that's doing it for you so that when you see the answers to your prayers, you're looking at what God's doing and you'll give him glory and praise for the answers that he see. you see that he's bringing to you. The Lord Jesus Christ tells you in Matthew 7 that if you ask, it will be given to you. If you seek, you will find. And if you knock, it will be opened to you. And he says it this way. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who knocks, finds. And to him who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. So, He finishes it by saying this way. If you know how to be a good father, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, you wouldn't give them a stone for bread and you wouldn't give them a serpent for fish. How much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to you who ask him? So we see another principle. You have to ask We see a second principle. He's a good father and he gives you good things. He doesn't give you a stone when you need bread. He doesn't give you a serpent when you need food. The Lord Jesus is teaching that if you ask for good gifts, 
for bread and not a stone, for a fish and not a serpent, then his name, according to his will, you will receive it because that's what he already has coming for you and toward you right now. Because he's meeting all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This passage in Matthew 7 is actually referring to their beginning of the discourse that began in Matthew chapter 5. And especially in Matthew 5, Matthew 6, 5 through 13, which we know is the Lord's Prayer. But the Lord is also reminding you that God is your Father. And as your father, God is better than you can even think, hope, ask, or imagine. He's better than any earthly parent. He's better than you can imagine. And he he encourages you to come to him with what you need, knowing that before you even ask him, he tells you in Matthew 6, 8, I know the things you have need of, so come to me. And let's talk about it. Get my perspective. Learn from me. And you will find that I already have those answers coming to you before you even thought about coming to me and asking me for what it is that you need. God is always on your side. He gives you mercy for your failures. And then he is the one who uplifts your prayers. He's the one who gives you grace to help in time of need. The Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus himself are interceding for you on your behalf according to the will of God. So first you have to know God deeply cares for you and he wants you to come to him in prayer. The Holy Spirit himself is operating in you and on you and through you as a born-again child of God. He's stirring your mind and your most holy emotions and thus persuading you that God has answers for you and that God wants you to come to him. Your father loves you and he's drawing you to himself to pray, to talk to him, to have a conversation with him. And he shows you five key instructions that you need to know so that you know that your prayers are heard and answered. The first one we've already mentioned is you have to ask him. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, he said, ask and it will be given to you. This is the very basic premise point and starting point of all prayer. However, it's also one that many people misunderstand. When he says ask him, it's the spirit of God himself alive and active in you is the one who stirring you to come to the Father to receive what the Father knows you already need. That means you're asking not what you need and what you want to put it on your own personal uh, thoughts, imaginations, but you're asking for what God wants in the situation, what God wants to do and what God can do. And I will assure you it's always greater than what you can ask for your own self. God says... I'll give you men and women and to help you and encourage you and bring helpers across your path. When you're saying, I just need a friend. God knows what you need. And he knows what you need and when you need it and how to get it to you. He tells you that when you come to the Father and you ask him, your asking shows your dependence upon him. For you're dismissing reliance upon yourself and self-governance, and you're coming to him for help to meet your needs. This means that your eyes are open to him working all around you to the things that he's doing so you can see that the answer you need, he has already sent. It's there. You need to see it. However, until you seek him and ask him, you won't see it. Because you won't see what he's doing around you. Because your eyes are blinded by the world. And you need to have the Holy Spirit open the eyes of your understanding. And enlighten you to what God's doing all around you. He tells you in John five seventeen that I've been working even now. And I'm still working. He's talking about for you. In Luke's account of Jesus' words, you learn an important truth. He records Jesus saying, Your heavenly Father gives the Holy 
Spirit to you who ask Him. That's right. The Holy Spirit's the one who stirs you to ask the Father what you need. It's because the Holy Spirit already knows what you need. So you learn to pray and worship and serve God. You have to know that you need His Spirit, which reveals to you His truth. And by revealing to you His truth, you know that He's the Spirit of truth. And the Father says that He gives you His Spirit so that you will know what to ask Him. And if you know what to ask Him because He's living in you, then that means that you're not living to ask for things under a worldly influence, but under the Spirit's influence. And you know that the world is dying. But you're living because the Spirit of the living God is in you and He's helping you. And God's power is actively at work in you, helping you on a daily basis to do those things that God would want you to do. The next thing you need is faith. The definition of faith is mis- Many people don't even know it. They think faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No, that's actually the application of faith. That's faith working. But what is faith? Faith is always, always, always a gift from God. And it's never something that can be produced by you. In short, for you as a believer, faith is God's divine persuasion. It's His Holy Spirit prompting you. It's his Holy Spirit directing you. It's completely distinct from your human belief or confidence, although it involves it. It's the Lord himself continuously birthing his divine persuasion in you so that you can know what he prefers. Or as it says in John 5, 1 John 5, 4, it's the persuasion of his will. The Holy Spirit in you draws you to the Father to ask and seek those things that the Father already has ready for you and wants to give to you. That's how you can know you have answered prayer. Faith is God's warranty. It's where he certifies that what he reveals, he will bring it to pass. It's always God working on your behalf. It's always the guarantee that his revelation will come to pass because his spirit giving you the revelation, revealing the word of God, showing you the promise, tells you that his word will not return to you void, but it will accomplish in your life what God has sent it to do. It's always received from God and God's divine prompting by his Holy Spirit operating on you and stirring in your mind and heart your most holy emotions, he thus persuades you to ask those things the Father wants you to ask him that he knows he already has ready for you and that by seeing them, by asking, you will see them because your eyes are now open to look expectantly for God to deliver to you those answers you seek in his timing and in his way. Abraham's a good example of God's birthing faith in him. When he told him that he would have a son at old age, Genesis 14, 14, what did Abraham respond? How did he respond? He didn't wait in unbelief or distrust, doubting and questioning God concerning the promise that God had given him in Genesis 14, 14. But it says in Romans 4, 20 that he grew strong. And listen to this. He was empowered by faith. That's God's divine persuasion. That's God giving him the faith to praise and give glory to him, being fully satisfied and assured that God persuading him would do the very thing that he told him he would do and that his word would come true what he promised him and he would be the father of many nations. Jesus gave clear instructions about praying in faith. In Mark eleven twenty two through 24, he said it quite quickly. He said, have faith in God. That means have God's divine persuasion in God. 
that God working in you is persuading you to ask the things that he wants you to ask, knowing that he's got the answers coming and that you are going to be blessed by him. And then he says, whatever you ask when you pray, you can believe that you've received them because you will have them because you're asking according to the will of God by the persuasion of God who's telling you and testifying with your own spirit that you're going to receive those things that God has planned for you. Essentially, to receiving from God is faith. You have to know that he's divinely persuading you on what to ask and knowing that he knows, you know that that need is met before you even ask. And that's faith. The third thing is you have to be persistent. The Holy Spirit reveals in scriptures that you should pray without ceasing or unceasingly pray in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. He's telling you that you have to have an open heart and mind to God all day long, that you just go around and thank God for all the things good that are happening. You get a parking place, you just thank God. He gives you a thought that's an answer to a problem you have. Thank you, Lord, for sharing that with me. He helps you with a situation that was just a moment ago. You didn't know how to answer it. You just thank him for it. You just praise him and you thank him for the small things and the big things. And by doing that in all things, then you see God around you because you're dependent upon God, looking for him to help you in all the things that he has for you. So you can rejoice always and you can pray without ceasing. And you'll be giving thanks in everything. And then you know that this is the will of God for you, just as it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Then he tells you about persistent prayer, that the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he had prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain. And it didn't rain on the land for three years and six months. But then he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit, just as he says in James five sixteen through 18. And then Jesus gives an example of the persistent widow. He says that there was a certain judge who did not fear God or regard man, and now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me, for my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continually coming, continually coming, she weary me. Then the Lord said this, Hear what the unjust judge says, And shall not God avenge his own elect who cried to him day and night, though he bears along with them. I tell you the truth. He will avenge you speedily. That's what God says. God has a plan for your life. He has a plan to help you. And that plan starts by you coming to him, asking him, seeking him for what he has for you. But to do that, you have to humble yourself. It's important to remind yourself, it's not about you. It's not about you at all. You're fully dependent upon God. And you dismiss reliance upon yourself and self-governance and empty your carnal ego so that you're asking what God would have you to ask. You're not asking from a worldly, fleshly perspective. You're asking what the Spirit is telling you to ask, what God's drawing you to receive. And God instructs you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then he tells you, at the right time, he'll honor you. First Peter 5, 6. When you humble yourself, you're putting God first. And when you put God first, you can watch things change around you. Putting God first is always an act of humility that honors God. He tells you, humble yourself. Show yourself to be low in your own estimation. When you come to the Father, as Jesus said, and you pray the Lord's Prayer, knowing that God knows the things you have need of before you pray, and he says, Our Father, which art in heaven, 
hallowed, which means holy is your name. Your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Listen, you're humbling yourself under the mighty power of God. You're humbling yourself under the God of the universe, the creator of all things. And this happens because you recognize that you're fully dependent upon God. And being fully dependent upon God, you know that God is in charge of you. That he's your father and you're his child. And that he loves you and wants the absolute best for you because he does. You can believe that God is giving you those things that you ask for because you come as a child to him knowing that your father will receive, will give to you what you ask and you will receive it. The last thing is you have to pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus is bigger than any obstacle you face. I'm telling you, there's nothing impossible for God. God created all things and he can make mountains move. He can move people from around the world to come into your area so that you can hear the word of God. I've seen him move people from Jerusalem to come see me. I've seen him move people from other places on the earth to come see me. And I've seen him move me to go other places on the earth to see other people, just to talk to one person. And, you know, God has a purpose in that. I don't ask the purpose. It's not my job. My job is to be obedient, to have the courage to go up and walk and do the things that God asked me to do. And so when I pray in the name of Jesus and you pray in the name of Jesus, You're praying knowing that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Jesus loves you and he wants the absolute best for you. He says that he loves you. He tells you, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Abide in my love. Continue in my love with me. John 5, 19. And then he demonstrates his love for you. That while you were yet in your weakness, powerless to help yourself, at the right time, Christ came to this earth and he died for you. Now, this is an extraordinary thing because one would die for you. That he would give up his life for you. You weren't a righteous person when he did that. You weren't noble or lovely or You weren't a generous benefactor that he was dying for. No. God clearly shows and Jesus himself shows and proves his own love for you by the fact that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Romans 5, 6 through 8. Remember this. Greater love, Jesus says, has no man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus laid down his life for your friends. You're his friend. You're a friend of God. You're not only a friend of God, but Jesus is your friend who sticks closer than a brother. When Jesus left, his disciples were concerned, but he told them this same thing, that he is the Lord told Joshua. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he never does. It's the Lord who strengthens you in all things. It's him who empowers you, making you ready for anything and equal to everything through his infusing his inner strength in you. When Peter and John were arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin, the chief priest asked a simple question of them. By what power or by what name have you healed this man at the gate called Beautiful? Acts 4, 7. Listen to Peter's response and listen closely to how he gave his response. It gives you the confidence and the courage you know and need that God is answering your prayer. Then Peter, listen, filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you hear it? Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, 
If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, it's by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. And then he just puts a, a stamp on it, and he says, And there is no salvation in any other, for there is no name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. God has highly exalted the name of Jesus because of the sacrifice that he made for you. And he has freely bestowed upon him the name that's above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth must bow. And every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus himself tells you, most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. John sixteen twenty three through 24. All power in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And you are his body and a member individually. And he is effectively work in you, exercising his power through you. You even have the mind of Christ. And you hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. Because he lives in you. It's no longer you who lives, but Christ lives in you. And that name of Christ is in you, and it's yours. And according to his mighty power that's at work in you, you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above what you can even ask, think, hope, or imagine. Ephesians 3.20 Jesus is telling you, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it. It's because when you ask in Jesus' name, you're asking as his personal representative. You're asking as his ambassador. And you're representing what God wants you to ask. You're the intercessor for others. You're the one whom the Holy Spirit's stirring to seek the best and the good for others and for yourself. So look to God and say yes to Jesus and embrace everything that he has for you. Pray in his name persuaded by the Holy Spirit to ask those things that God has already prepared for you to receive, knowing that all your needs are known before him and to him before you even ask, and that God who loves you, who fills, him with you, fills you with himself, directs you and keeps you in all the ways of your life. And he has made your footsteps to go in a straight way so that you can know the things he's given you. When you don't hear God and when you don't see God operating around you by the prayers that you're answering, you may be asking amiss because you want to put it on your own selfishness or on the things that you want from the flesh. But get back in front of God. Say, Father, what would you have me to do in this situation? Father, I just lift up your word to you. You say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My God meets all my needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That you want me to come to you. And you want me to ask you those things that you already have planned for me and that you're going to do through me. And I just thank you, Father, that you love me and you want the best for me. And you ask the Father what he would have you do. Don't ask what you can do for him. Ask what he wants you to do for him. There's a slight difference there. And the difference is this. You're dependent upon God. You're under the mighty authority and hand of God. And under his mighty hand and under his mighty authority, you dismiss reliance upon yourself and self-governance and ain't be your carnal ego so that you can be filled with all the fullness of God. 
the richest measure of your his divine presence, your body wholly filled and flooded with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God himself, and then you become an answer to prayer for others because you are God's answer. God is answering you so that you can answer others. It's just as he said in 2 Corinthians 9. He says, I make you a blessing that you can bless others and that that blessing I bless you with, that causes them to be giving thanksgiving to him. And he comforts you so that you can comfort others. God is for you. He hears you. And you can go to sleep and wake up every day knowing that God not only knows what you need, but he has it coming to you. And the easiest way to see it is to get into his presence, to keep an open channel with him, and to seek him in all your moments so that you don't miss anything that he's prepared for you and he's delivering to you. Open your eyes to what God's doing. And you'll be amazed how God answers your prayers every day. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.